Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marat Fine. I'm a program manager at the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm really pleased to introduce um, the folks from Avodah and from the Litauer Foundation who are going to be speaking with us today about the power of leadership and how it can impact poverty. Um, we're going to be hearing first from uh, Cheryl Cook, who has 25 years of experience at in this field as a leader, a manager, a fundraiser, is the executive director of Avodah, and she's going to tell us a bit about the meat of what Avodah does. We're going to hear from an Avodah alumna, um, Jessica Schaefer, uh, who is also the director of Highest Chicago, and also Suzanne Feinspan, the deputy director of Avodah. Uh, and finally, we're going to hear from a JFN member, Alan Divak, who's a program director at the Lucius and Litauer Foundation, um, who is working with Avoda as a philanthropist as well. I'm really excited to get started and hear more about um, the great work that Avoda is doing and how um, how the Litauer Foundation is engaged in it. Uh, the Jewish Funders Network, we're really interested in understanding how our funders are doing their work, what inspires them to do their work. We really value Tikkun Olam, um, and so we're excited, excited to get started. So without further ado, um, Cheryl, take it away. Great. Thank you, Mayrav. Um, I'm Cheryl Cook, and I'm the Executive Director of Avodah, and I am here with my colleague, Suzanne Feinspan, who's Avodah's Deputy Director. And many years ago, Suzanne was also an Avodah Corps member herself. We're delighted to be speaking with you today in this partnership with Jewish Funders Network and the Litauer Foundation. So, hold on. So, our topic today is alleviating poverty through Jewish leadership. Hopefully, many of you have heard about Avodah before. We're best known for our Jewish Service Corps, a Jewish leadership development and domestic anti poverty program. Service seems to be a buzzword in the world today, certainly in the Jewish world. Last month, I attended a conference where a mix of Jewish professionals, philanthropists, journalists, and other thought leaders were talking about the next big idea in Jewish life. What did everyone come up with? Service as a rite of passage for the Jewish community, something Jews expect one another to do. And I like that bold vision. It's what drew me to Avodah, an organization that has already created this rite of passage for post-college age Jews. Service as a means to create a just world is a Jewish concept. So is learning and creating community. Avodah is about creating links between these three. So our vision is simple. We believe in the power of Jewish leaders to transform the world around them and the power of this social change work to renew and strengthen Jewish life. Every time I meet an Avodah alumni, I'm reminded about the power of this work. So let me introduce you to Jessica Schaefer, who participated in the Avodah Service Corps program in 2007. I'll let her tell you her story. Thank you, Cheryl, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it's, it's really my pleasure to be with you all today to talk um, a little bit about my Avodah journey, because I credit Avodah with sort of transforming the way that I operate in the world today. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit about how, how Avodah impacted sort of my Jewish identity, how Avodah shaped my professional career, and then how those two sort of inform one another now. Um, so I was raised in a, a fairly homogeneous modern Orthodox Jewish community in Montreal where everyone understood and practiced their Judaism in very similar ways. Um, so we, I went to day school, for example, and to overnight camp, and we learned Hebrew, and it was our Judaism was expressed um, sort of through our observance and through our, our tradition. Um, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, as were most of the grandparents, my friends' grandparents, um, and we sort of all tried to live the values that they brought with them um, when they came to Canada, and those were often sort of very traditional religious values. Then as I was nearing the end of college, a relative of mine who had been living in the Boston area um, told me about Avodah. I was, I was wondering what I should do after college, and she told me that this is a pluralistic Jewish program. 
And to be honest, at that time, I really had no idea what pluralism entailed. I didn't have an idea of what that concept meant. But it was a Jewish program. And Jewish to me was familiar and safe. And I was looking for um, something to take me out of the Montreal community. I had grown up there, gone to college there. And so this was sort of, for me, what I thought was a perfect fit. And I actually applied late. And there was one spot available um, in Chicago. And I, and I just jumped on it. Um, I loved what the, what the sort of program was talking about. And I wanted to learn more and to, to engage with it. And again, I thought that this is going to be a very sort of comfortable and familiar atmosphere. And I learned quickly. Um, that I wasn't so right in that assumption. Um, coming to be a part of Avodah was really the first time that I met other individuals who identified as Jewish, but whose practices and whose beliefs um, and whose rituals were so very different than mine. Um, I actually remember on one of our very first um, weekends together, we went on a weekend retreat in Wisconsin, and we left on a Friday, so we were there over Shabbat, and each person was responsible for taking um, over sort of a piece of the of the programming for the weekend. And I, I don't even remember what piece of Shabbat this fell within, but whoever was responsible for sort of leading the, the Shabbat service um, during the service referred to God as a woman. And this was something that I had never experienced before and never been exposed to. Um, and I sort of got to be very emotional. Um, and it was a very, very hard moment for me because, again, here I was in what I thought was going to be this very safe and comfortable and familiar environment, and it was totally jostling everything that I had believed to be true at that moment. Um, and many of sort of the Jewish interactions throughout the year were, were very similar. Um, you know, I had sort of the boundaries of my own Judaism pushed, and I, I would say in a very, very positive way, you know, we had a lot of dialogue around um, feminist Jewish practice in Israel and what did it mean to be observant. Um, and, you know, the idea of tikkun olam, a lot of conversations about what is tikkun olam, and that was actually a concept that I hadn't heard much about in the community, the Jewish community that I grew up in. And so to be introduced to the idea of tikkun olam and to think about how one could sort of express their Judaism, not through sort of religious traditional observance, but through this, um, this idea of, of repairing the world, um, of working beyond just our own Jewish community was really something very new to me um, and something that I struggled with during that year but really have come to appreciate um, now that I'm a number of years past um, my Avodah experience. And then speaking sort of to the professional growth that Avodah gave me, as a core member I was placed at the Ethiopian Community Association of Chicago, which is a refugee resettlement organization. And similarly, I knew nothing about that realm of work. Um, either, but I came to really grow and came to really love it. Um, I really just love the interaction with diverse communities, learning about how other folks live their life, um, learning about their values and sort of integrating some of those into my own practice and into my own belief system. And during that year, um, as a core member, Avodah provided us with programming and opportunities for conversation and dialogue around power and privilege and justice um, and systems and systems change. And that really provided a framework for me to understand the work that I was doing in the refugee resettlement realm, um, and also just to understand sort of my place um, as a privileged person working in this anti-poverty social justice realm. Um, that was that language, the social justice language, was not something that I had prior to um, being an Avoja core member. Um, and that year at the Ethiopian Community Association really sort of set me on my current career path. So um, following that year, I. We were resettling a lot of Burmese refugees. I was so curious to know, you know, where were these folks coming from? What was their experience? So I traveled to the Thai-Burmese border, did some work there, um, worked with Heartland Alliance, if you're familiar, American Jewish World Service, um, and then finally just recently became the director of Hyas Chicago, which is a refugee resettlement, citizenship, and immigration organization um, here in Chicago. And so had it not been for that first connection with Avodai, I don't know that I would have been sitting, that I would be sitting. Um, in this chair right now. Um, and I think sort of how everything has come full circle is really fascinating. It was my year in Avodah, was, it was challenging, and I was pushed a lot and learned a lot and grew a lot um, and struggled a lot. But now the way that I sort of understand my own Judaism um, is through the work that I'm doing at this organization. So as I, as I mentioned, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And for so long, um, I thought that I had to sort of observe um, a certain way or engage with my Judaism in a certain way to sort of honor them and their experience. 
and now I, I don't sort of identify as modern orthodox anymore, but I understand that I am now honoring um, their Judaism and their history through this refugee resettlement tikkun olam sort of work. Um, so I'm expressing my Judaism in a very different way, um, personally and professionally, I think because of the experiences that Aboda gave me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, it's leaders like Jessica that inspired me to come to Avoda nine months ago. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, so Avoda has created a model that's meeting many of the challenges in our country and in the Jewish community today. So you heard about some of this, but what are some of the challenges facing the Jewish community? Um, widening divide between various segments uh, of the Jewish community. Uh, from secular to religious, um, and Jessica, you spoke to this really nicely, um, across the political spectrum. And I really would say I, you know, I, we struggle to speak to each other across difference often, though we're working on it. Um, I think the recent debate over the U.S. policy in Iran is one of the most dramatic examples of this. Also, Jews are less engaged in the Jewish community than in the past, um, and more so the younger generation. There's lots of projects that have sprung up to address this um, over time, and it's still something that we struggle with. Uh, and last, many young Jews lack a holistic sense of how Jewish identity can inform their whole selves. At the same time, our country faces tremendous challenges, uh, and it's just a complex world today. There's tremendous economic inequality and many, many consequences from that. One of the leading challenges in our country is poverty, which has long-term societal and individual impacts beyond the obvious economic ones. There's many challenges in our country like racism, sexism, homophobia that are connected to or overlap with poverty. So here's some statistics on poverty today. 19.9 .9 million Americans live in extreme poverty. This means their family's cash income is less than half of the poverty line or about $10,000 a year for a family of four. And a total of almost 47 million people in America live before the, below the government-defined poverty line. That's one in eight Americans. In addition, one in four American households is asset poor, meaning they do not have enough net worth to stay at or above the poverty line for three months if their income is interrupted. For example, due to job loss, or a medical emergency. These numbers are heartbreaking. Almost 52 years ago, President Lyndon Johnson declared an unconditional war on poverty. Still, on December 1, 2015, this war has not been won. In our own country, still by far the richest country in the world, millions of children suffer, and the pervasive problems of rising food costs, loss of jobs, disappearance of affordable housing, poor schooling, and lack of access to health care must be addressed if we are to, not to lose more of this genera generation to inequality and injustice. So 18 years ago, Rabbi David Rosen created the first cohort of Avodah's Jewish Service Corps with nine core members. Here's the picture. He could have picked almost any issue for the Corps to work on. He chose poverty, which is an issue broad enough to encompass many of the most pressing issues of our country, and an issue that continues to galvanize the next generation to be engaged in this work. So we know that Jewish tradition requires us to play a role with the challenges we face in the world. Do not oppress the stranger, for you are strangers in Egypt. This concept is mentioned over and over in the Torah, 36 times, more than keeping kosher more than fasting on Yom Kippur. This is a core foundation of our tradition that has continued over time through the prophets, through Heschel, and through Ruth Messenger. From the very beginning, Jewish tradition has taught us to help make the world a better place, to look after the stranger, and to be a light onto nations. Today, as the Jewish people and communities around the world face extraordinary and complex challenges, it's more important than ever to strengthen Jewish efforts to repair the world and make the imperative of tikkun olam central to Jewish identity and purpose. As Ruth says, we cannot retreat to the convenience of being overwhelmed. 
there's work for us to do. And we know from the buzz about service in our community, from the Pew study on American Jewry, that this work is resonating with people, especially with the younger generation. While the 2013 Pew study noted high rates of younger Jew, Jewish adults disengaging from our community, it also evidenced a major shift in self-identification, especially among millennials. When asked what it means to be Jewish in America today, two of the top three answers were leading an ethical moral life and working for justice and equality. And I don't have the breakdown here on numbers by generation, but I would guess that if we were to break this down by generation, those two things would be the top answers. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at the GA sponsored by the Jewish Federations of North America, and I sat with a large group of college students. I asked them about their experience at the conference. They overwhelmingly told me that they felt like there was still an overemphasis on Jewish connection to Holocaust and anti-Semitism. And while they thought both of these things were important, they were looking for a positive vision of a Jewish future. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Suzanne, who played a leading role in designing some of the work we talk about as Avodah's approach. Hi, everybody. So at Avodah, we've created models uh, that bridge the interest and need for service, justice, learning, and creating community, and brought all of those together in, in one place. Um, our ongoing work is to develop thousands of Jewish leaders who are changing the world by fighting poverty and promoting social justice and who are grounded in Jewish community and tradition. And through that, we're creating lifelong leaders for social change. Avodah offers many entry points. Some people come to Avodah because they're passionate about working for justice in the world. Some come to Avodah because they're interested in a year of service. Some come because it's an opportunity to get real work experience in a field they're considering going into, like law, healthcare, or policy. And some come because they're looking for a post-college Jewish immersive experience. So what's our approach? It's a deep and immersive one. Um, immersive service and immersive, immersive in service and immersive in Jewish community. So it has um, sort of three main, we call it a three-legged stool. Um, so the first leg of the stool is that our programs and our work expose the young people in the programs to the realities of poverty. They engage in full-time service. They're working in school systems or in the criminal justice system. They work in legal aid organizations or in healthcare organizations and many more. Um, they build relationships with individuals in those organizations, clients, and staff, and they begin to understand the day-to-day -day impacts of poverty. And they work within those local, state, and federal systems and learn about the services that the systems provide and the challenges that individuals face in accessing those services, and they see the ways that their clients are and are not helped by those systems. The second leg of the stool is that we have an intense and really powerful curriculum. Our participants come to understand the root causes of poverty and the systemic changes needed to make changes in the country um, and have all of that grounded in Jewish tradition. They learn that while it's critical that meals are served in a soup kitchen because people are hungry day in and day out, that if we only meet this immediate need and don't try to understand the larger systems that cause hunger to exist and seek to change those systems, then we'll never actually get rid of hunger. And then the final leg of the stool is that while they do this while living or participating in an inclusive and supportive Jewish community, a community of peers, a community of friends who are all doing similar work and who are learning together and supporting each other. And what this support means is that they're coming home to each other at night to talk about their day, they're networking about ways they can better help each other's clients, and they're taking care of each other. And that's some of the most important work that happens as a part of the program because the work that all of our participants are doing is really hard and challenging, and they, as leaders they need to be sustained in that work, and the community aspect is really what does that. Um, and we know that this immersive approach, um, especially within the context of community, is a really powerful one. There have been many studies done over the years of youth trips to Israel um, in terms of day schools and Jewish camps, different programs that are intense, all-encompassing Jewish environments, and all of those have found, um, have found this sort of immersive environment to be a really effective one in instilling a commitment to ongoing involvement in Jewish life. 
so through this set of experiences and learning, we're creating leaders who are really committed to this work, who are um, very talented and skilled in the work, and who are committed to it for the long haul. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. So um, let me touch quickly on our programs. So here is a visual of our four areas that we work in. Uh, the program that we're best known for is our Jewish Service Corps, which is like a domestic Peace Corps for post-college age adults. It's an immersive year of service at an anti-poverty organization in Chicago, New York, New Orleans, or Washington, D.C. During the year, core members live together in a bayit, a house, and participate in weekly educational programs to deepen their understanding of domestic poverty and explore their work through the lens of Jewish tradition, regularly facilitated by local experts, educators, and community leaders. Gabriella Geller, who was in the Service Corps last year in Chicago, describes the Corps more eloquently than I could. It was Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel who said of marching for civil rights alongside Martin Luther King that he was praying with his feet. Avodah has given us 11 months to worship with our hands, to live our questions, to embody our values. And indeed, this program is the definition of its name, the Hebrew word which means to worship, to work, and to serve. We also have an Avodah Fellowship, which is a non-residential program for early career professionals. And when our core members and fellows finish their program, it's just the beginning. They join our vibrant alumni network, which is featured as one of the model alumni networks by the Schusterman Foundation's Alumni Playbook. And I think that my colleagues are speaking on a conference call later this week with Jewish Funders Network more about our alumni programming. We also do a series of community engagement projects. Um, we have a huge repository of curricula, of workshops, and we are starting to speak and teach and convene to uh, bring these issues out with the larger Jewish community. So after 18 years, what do we know? First, we're building capacity for a network of anti-poverty organizations. We've worked with 174 anti-poverty organizations. Right now I think we have 57 organizations that we're partnering with. And these are some of the best anti-poverty organizations in the country. We've served over half a million clients and have added approximately $14.7 million of staffing capacity. We're rigorous in our evaluation of what we bring to the organizations. Since I joined, I've heard, I've heard over and over from our partner organizations that our participants exceed the contributions of virtually every other comparable organization. One placement told me that they stopped accepting members of another service corps because our people are so much stronger. One in three of our alumni have worked for their placement organizations after finishing the service corps. And three out of four said that their current jobs involve anti-poverty or social justice work. So this is part of the staying in this work for the long haul. Many of our placement partners have multiple avodonics on staff, like the Urban Assembly School for Law and Justice, which prepares students who come from underserved communities and will be the first to go to college for success in college and career. And many, many, um, I keep hearing about times where a prior Service Corps member now supervises a current Service Corps member. So we're also learning that we've created Jewish leaders to alleviate poverty and become change makers grounded in Jewish community and tradition. So you've already heard from Jessica. Here's just a couple numbers from an independent study of our alum in 2012. So 92% of our alumni say that Avodah set them on their current career path. That means that almost every person who's been through Avodah chose their career based on their Avodah experience. That's pretty powerful. 83% say Avodah altered their long-term career plans. 
95% say that AVODA strengthened their commitment to social justice issues as a whole. 81% say it inspired them to take on more significant leadership roles. 80% say it influenced their philanthropic giving decisions. And 85% of our alums say that it helped them find their place in the Jewish community. So who are some of the people who have come out of Avoda? Um, some of you may know Lonnie Santo. Lonnie participated in Avoda in Washington, D.C., where she was a case manager for homeless women. She's now executive director at Footsteps, an organization that helps Jews leaving black hat and Hasidic communities and supports them through counseling, social events, and support groups. During her five-year tenure, she's tripled the size of the staff and budget so that the organization can serve more clients more effectively. She recently was profiled in the Jewish Week's 36 Under 36. Uh, or Erin Dobish. Erin was in one of our earliest cohorts of core members in New York City in 2000. We placed him with, the homelessness and housing, with a homelessness and housing organization, one of the most effective organizations fighting homelessness in New York called Common Ground, and he was a tenant services associate. He never left Common Ground. Today, 15 years later, he's their associate director of housing operations, managing supportive housing units for people struggling with homelessness throughout New York City. He says that Avodah gave him the ethical and spiritual grounding for doing this work and has provided a supportive community for all these years. And Rachel Sumac. Rachel was a core member in 2012 in Chicago where she was a case manager focusing on homelessness. Today she is co-founder and currently ED of Swipe Out Hunger, an organization that's creatively inspired university campuses and students to alleviate hunger. Rachel was recently chosen as a White House Champion of Change and was on the forwards list of Millennials Creating Change. She's also active in the Jewish community in Los Angeles. So I'm not going to give you the bios of all 100 of the Avodah alum, but you can find them in rabbinical school, in Jewish and social justice organizations, and on the boards of many organizations. We're serious about creating leaders. And we're engaged in thought leadership role, in a thought leadership role in the Jewish community. We are sending our alum and our staff out to speak and teach and lead workshops for organizations like BBYO, USY, JTS, and UJA Federation of New York. We help grant makers shape and strengthen their anti-poverty work. And we're supporting our alumni community through convenings, through mentorship and networking and creating new initiatives in partnership with them. Many of our alum have been involved in starting a Jewish organization since finishing Avodah. And last, we are creating a more inclusive and vibrant Jewish community. A growing number of leaders in the Jewish community, rabbis, educators, and volunteers came out of Avodah. When we came to New Orleans in 2008, um, shortly after Hurricane Katrina, um, we, that's, we, were, we came to New Orleans shortly after Hurricane Katrina devastated the city. And seven years later, we're still there, and our alumni are a vibrant part of Jewish life in the city. Our alum are involved in virtually every aspect and every facet of Jewish community, and many have played leading roles in establishing new minyanim coordinating events for young Jewish adults, and creating new initiatives. Recently, Avodah core members and alum helped plan and coordinate Tulane Hillel's annual Shabbat 1000 event, which brought together members of the community for a thousand-person Shabbat dinner, which is huge for New Orleans. And New Orleans is soon going to be hosting a new program, which is a convening for alum from any service corps, from Avodah, from Teach for America, from City Year or others to come together for Shabbaton to build relationships, celebrate together, and continue to leverage relationships and networking to make New Orleans a, a better city. Um, so this is a program that we will be launching in the spring. 
So we're part of a larger response, a larger, broader Jewish communal response to poverty in America. And I should have Hayas on here too, but Mazon, Jewish Federations, Hayas, Repair the World, there's great work being done. And Avodah alum have worked at almost every Jewish social justice organization in the United States. When I sit with Jewish social justice leaders now, I tell them that I hope we're grooming the next leaders of their organizations. I read a definition of leadership recently that I really like. Good leaders define reality and give hope. That's what Avodah is about. And that's also what the Litauer Foundation is doing. Alan and the foundation have been thoughtful strategic partners with Avodah and I believe are guided by a desire to help define a new reality and give hope. I'm going to turn this over to Alan Divak, the program director at the Lucius and Litauer Foundation. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, that is an old picture of me. I won't say how old. Uh, anyway, first, I, I'd just like to talk a few seconds about what the Litauer Foundation is, a little bit about our work with Avodah currently, how it's evolved, and where we think it may be going in the future. Um, we were established in 1929 by Lucius and Litauer, uh, a businessman, philanthropist, and politician who died in 1944. Uh, we are now an independent foundation with a very broad charter, and we have no ties to the donor or family. So our board really has a very wide discretion. Um, we currently give about $3 million a year, and about 60% of it is focused on New York City. And it's mostly in education, social services, and Jewish communal life. And other areas of interest include education and workforce development in Israel and Judaica libraries and archives. We're probably best known uh, for our work in Jewish studies over several decades. Um, it, it, the, how we got involved with Avodah is sort of interesting because it started with an advertisement in the Jewish Week. So lest you think that nobody looks at ads in the Jewish Week and Jewish communal publications, you know, sometimes it, it, it can have some impact. And uh, uh, about maybe 10 to 15 years ago, sure, not that long after Avodah was founded, um, JTS, actually ran an advertisement talking about how its students could be found in a variety of, of roles, and not just as heads of congregation. And it featured David Rosen, the, the founding director of Avodah. And uh, one of our board members, now who's currently our president, saw it and said, hmm, that sounds interesting. And so he reached out. And Avodah appealed to our interest in, in volunteerism, which has been very strong, you know, over several decades, and leadership development in Jewish community, and also to this board member's interest in mobilizing Jewish resources and values in the service of society as a whole. And we made a steady series of general support grants to Avodah, and I say, see here starting in, in 2007. And then uh, this year we increased it and made a multi-year commitment. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, several reasons for that. First of all, um, we just so admire the work that Avodah has been doing, but we also felt that just like Avodah shows that you have to invest for the long term in future generations of leadership and that it takes time, we felt that this kind of organization, which was so close to our values in this way, deserved uh, a multi-year commitment. Um, ah, okay, so uh, just a few words about how our relationship with Avodah has been evolving. Uh, we have a, we used to have, be very, rather distant from our grantees. They would submit a letter on a yearly basis and we would, um, and we would fund or, or not fund based on that request. And the board wanted uh, the staff, which is me basically, to engage more closely with grantees and also to think more strategically about poverty in New York City. And it's interesting, I spoke to a colleague from a former job and he said, well, you know, if you're interested in learning about approaching your work dealing with poverty differently, the first thing you should be doing is talking to your grantees. And I was so, so impressed with the thoughtfulness and the deep knowledge that Avodah staff brought. Um, and this is, I think, both through their curriculum 
uh, through learning about Jewish values and poverty, but also their real on-the-ground knowledge about grassroots organizations. Um, and this is, this is really, I think, helped us to start to transform uh, our, our work with poverty. And I remember in particular one, one remark that uh, – Suzanne had made to me, a, 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 Suzanne from who you, you heard before, talking about uh, one way that we should be approaching poverty is the, is the importance of looking for organizations that actually give the poor a voice and that are based on the priorities that are articulated by poor communities, that we who live in um, you know, in our own world with a lot of resources and often a lot of power, really should be listening to those we want to, we want to benefit. And that's a lens that I've brought to so much of our work. And, and this is something that I really owe, owe to the colleagues at Avoda. So I, I think Cheryl also spoke about helping grant makers to change the way that they approach poverty. And I think that this is something very important, maybe is the largest takeaway that I would have to our conversation here for the, for the other philanthropists on the call is, you know, to talk about your grantee, to, excuse me, to talk with your grantees, to you, use their knowledge of what's happening on the ground to help you engage with issues that are, for, that are of importance to you. So anyway, I'll leave it at there and just sort of open it up to, uh, um, to I guess, May Rav or Cheryl to, to moderate any discussion. Hi there. Uh, this is Marav again. Thank you all so much for these presentations. Um, it was wonderful to kick it off with uh, Jessica to learn about you know, firsthand what your experience has been and to start to get a better understanding of how leaders can impact more broadly uh, how poverty is handled in this country um, and also through a Jewish lens. And um, Alan, for telling us a little bit about your your journey as a funder in this space. Um, are there any folks? I can unmute all the lines. Um, if any folks have specific the conference has been unmuted. Um, and you all can feel free to just speak out. So you've all been unmuted. Um, I'll be quiet for a second to see if that's something you're interested in doing. Okay. Um, one question somebody typed into me um, to to Alan. Uh, I know you mentioned that this is really coloring the work that you're doing in terms of coming coming from a funder's perspective and trying to speak with each of your grantees. Can you speak a little bit? to what the process has been like doing that? Have you put a process into place, how you're engaging with grantees on it, et cetera? Okay, there has not been a formal process, um, but at least in terms of our work in New York City, which is where we've been doing it, I think, or, or where, where we started to do it most systematically, um, is to first identify grantees uh, that our board members respected, that they thought were good and that they thought might add to the conversation. Uh, and then I w I've approached them uh, and just brainstormed with them and asked them what, asked them what they th thought a philanthropy might do better to address the needs of the poor in New York City. Uh, so I've spoken to, I mean, we give or have given in the past a very large number of very small grants. Uh, we're looking to give larger grants, and I think fewer of them in the future. But um, so we would ask, or, or I would meet, and occasionally one of our board members would meet with a grantee and ask them, you know, for what their ideas were with funding in, in poverty. Uh, and we've gotten a wide variety of ideas. Some, some. Uh, think we should be focused on helping the poor to build assets. Uh, others on the educational system, others on sort of smoothing the pathways from school uh, to work and self-sufficiency. Others think there are a lot of opportunities in the foster care system. So we're still in process on this. We haven't reached any conclusion as to what we would focus on. But it's been uh, a tremendous process in that we've learned by just meeting people 
on the ground who we were not meeting before, you know, and seeing what, what they're struggling with and how they're contributing to, to improve the lives of poor New Yorkers. Thank you, Alan. Um, and from your perspective, um, can the folks at Avodah speak to what, what the process of um, working with funders this closely is like, if you've got experience in that? Yeah, so I think the one, this is Suzanne, the one um, real example of this that we've had, um, in-depth example, has been with the Latera Foundation, and I think the way that we approached that conversation is that Alan um, contacted us um, with several questions and sort of based on the interests that they had and the kinds of things they were, in, they were interested in learning about, we thought about um, both sort of what um, expertise we could share from our curriculum, but also which of our placement organizations that we partner with, specifically in New York, were good examples of the kind of really um, deep investment and, and really impactful work um, that we could share with uh, the Latara Foundation. So that's sort of how we approached that conversation. I see. Thank you guys so much. I don't think there are any additional questions. It doesn't seem like anyone else is typing in or coming through. So I think we can end now. Again, this will be uh, this has been recorded and it'll be posted on our website, sent out to all of you as a resource if you want to learn more about how funders or the Latower Foundation specifically is working with uh, grantees to better support them and also to learn more about how Avoda is working with leaders to alleviate poverty um, and to hear these stories again, which were beautiful and really inspiring. Um, thank you all for joining us and taking some time out of your afternoon to learn together, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Great. Thanks, Mayor Thanks. Thanks, all. Thank you, Mayor Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.